This is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News, and we're delighted to have Jim Jeffries, who is IEEE President for the U.S. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. Well, you just published the 2015 edition of the IEEE U.S. Salary and Benefits Survey, and I got to tell you, the first question that jumped out at me is uh, the, the, the median incomes of the communication technology engineers. Can you tell me a little bit about why, where they rank and what some of the driving factors for them being at the top of the heap might be? Well, the communications sector uh, came out very high in the survey, uh, near the top. There's some individual categories that were higher, but as a category, it came out very high in the survey. Uh, you know, we've done the survey for 28 years, and we always try to take the segment information because it's of interest uh, to members and the public. I'd say some of the factors that influence the communication sector are maybe the location of key communication companies uh, in high tech and entrepreneur areas, maybe higher cost areas, which would drive the salaries a little bit higher. Also, I think there's a supply and demand uh, element uh, at work. Um, you know, it's a hot field and there's a lot going on in the area. And finally, I think the nature of the work might be driving some of the performance. Uh, when uh, engineers are working closely to the research uh, side of things and implementing rapidly, uh, there tends to be uh, a need for those to work closely together and perhaps uh, drive a, a high caliber of engineers. So I think it's a very important segment and it appears to be uh, strong in our salary survey. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other items that jumped out at me were the closing of the um, uh, gender and, and ethnic gaps. Can you talk a bit about the results this year? Yes, we've always tracked the uh, relationship between uh, the average salaries as well as the subcomponents in, in gender and, and race. This year, um, basically, there continues to be a gap, uh, which is important to document, and part of the survey is to make sure that, that information is available. But we also saw a closing of the gap, which is a positive sign. And in that closing, uh, basically, we uh, saw, you know, still a thirteen to fifteen thousand dollar gap, but two to three thousand dollar improvement over the twenty thirteen salary in both categories. So we are seeing uh, the direct reporting by members the closing of that gap. And what are some of the specific programs that IEEE puts in place to maybe particularly focus on women, for example? <laughs> Well, for uh, women, we have affinity groups, uh, and so we have a women in engineering program, and an affinity group is, is really a chance for uh, members who are, are in that group to get together and to explore the things that are most important to them, the most impactful. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I attended a Women in Engineering East Coast Summit uh, in Philadelphia, had a chance to, to see women who've been successful in developing their careers in technology and engineering, and also to understand the factors that might be important. So it's certainly the sharing of information. We also have eBooks available uh, through IEEE USA, and some of our most uh, awarded titles in the eBook series are the Women in Engineering series, providing important information on career development. So it's a focus on, on the site. Got it. And I know the, the average age has remained pretty much constant, kind of mid to, mid to low 40s. Um, what specific programs does IEEE have in place to really attract and engage the, the next generation of engineers? We're very concerned about the students and, of course, their first job is as a young professional and their relationship to a professional society. Uh, you know, all professional societies are facing a challenge of relevance uh, with this demographic. Uh, we have student branches at thousands of universities around the country. We have 15,000 student members, 12,000 graduate student members, and we have a set of special programs focused on uh, their needs for professional as well as technical. So our student professional awareness conferences, uh, we sponsor speakers, uh, we will provide funding to support the events, and so we try to, to make sure that they understand the importance of a career uh, as well as a technical development and try to sell them on the idea that a professional society has something to offer them. Uh, so that transition is very important. Move from a student member to a senior member, you know, is something we'd like to see them do and encourage that very strongly. Also, for the first time the next year, we'll be having a student and young professional conference focused just on them. It'll be at Tulane University uh, in the summer of 2016 and we're doing that for the whole country. Uh, we also have a Rising Stars Conference taking place uh, in Las Vegas the first week of January next year, focused on students and young professionals. So we understand the extreme importance of this demographic, moving them into full membership and understanding the value professional societies might bring to them, and we work hard to, to make that message. Well, I think the, one of the key trends of the millennials, they tend to be more transient. They, they'll change jobs more. They like moving to where the action is, and. Uh, uh, just by the sheer virtue of um, the, the technology companies today, they're bought, they're sold, things move very quickly as, as opposed to 
maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago where you go to work for Bell Company, you stay there a while or IBM, et cetera. But one of the things I, I found really interesting about IEEE is that in every market I go to, there'll be very strong local chapters and it provides very unique uh, networking opportunities. And I think that combined with some of the rising star programs you have uh, should provide excellent ways for, for kind of the younger generation to, to create the resume network and, and get some recognition. But I'd be kind of curious how you see the local chapters fitting in with some of these other initiatives that you talked about. Well, always the local sections, uh, and we have 230 of them in the United States, they're a major touch point. Uh, they're responsible for the relationship with the student branches. And within each one of our sections, in addition to the general programs, we have our chapters. So we have you know, many thousands of chapters uh, in each one of our 41 specialties. And so it's uh, those connections that, that do provide the, the breadth of richness for our members, I think. So when they attend those, attend those meetings, uh, students are always invited, they're generally invited, and uh, you know, they can really make a part of that. That also is another way in. Well, let's close by maybe giving us some insight as to how the survey was compiled. And then uh, what are some of the maybe the, the unseen trends or learnings that you, you uncovered while putting together the survey? Well, the survey went out to 100,000 of our members in the United States. About 12,000 of them responded to the survey. And within that, there were nine to 10,000 that are working in their primary area of interest. And so what's unique about this survey is it's not a compilation of data from other surveys or something. It's a direct input from those that are doing the jobs and working in the areas. Um, but, you know, that methodology provides a, a real strength in the survey. Uh, also, uh, in the survey, we have calculator. And so regression analysis you know, can be applied uh, to fill in, in the gap if you want to know what's a reasonable salary uh, for a particular specialty in a particular area. Mm -hmm. you know, regression analysis uh, approach can, can get an answer to that question. And so uh, people that participate in the survey uh, get to have the results and access to the calculator for free. Our student members, for the first time a couple of years ago, we granted access to them. To the salary so they could begin to think about areas maybe they haven't worked in or geographies they haven't ever visited but they can get a feeling uh, for this so methodology in the survey is to take a broad-based approach to understand what's happening by age by demographic by specialty by region and to put all that together in a way, helpful way and then apply the regression analysis opportunity so that uh, members can apply it to their particular needs and what was, that, what was your biggest takeaway or aha when you looked at the numbers this year? What really jumped out at you? So I think that uh, one is the, sort of the, the richness and, and the balance uh, across the survey. And mm -hmm. So we see improvements in salary, which hadn't been the case in the late 19, uh, first part of the last decade. Uh, we're seeing rising salaries in real terms. Uh, we're seeing a closing of, of gender and race gap. Uh, we're seeing uh, benefits shifting but maintaining. So if you look at the benefits, and we see satisfaction, uh, which isn't a big part of the survey, but is included, uh, we see satisfaction improving. So, so it seems like a, a positive uh, environment uh, for the profession, and uh, we're always interested in supporting everything for all the technical professionals in the United States. Well, for those who may not be intimately familiar with IEEE, could you give us a, a high-level overview of how it's organized and maybe how some of these special interest groups exist to... Uh, uh, connect the dots between some of the different societies. Sure. So IEEE USA uh, was formed about 40 years ago, and it was formed actually in a period of employment crisis. Um, there were uh, uh, layoffs happening as the space race began to wind down. There were pension portability questions. There were job security questions, which hadn't been a big part of the profession. So IEEE USA, since that time, has been focused on building careers and shaping public policy on behalf of our members in the United States, some 200,000 members uh, today. And, um, you know, the career side, we've talked a little bit about the importance of the career side. The salary survey is one of those elements. But we also offer webinars and, and e-books and training uh, for our members. On the public policy side, uh, we also try to look for public policy changes and initiatives that will enhance the profession uh, in the United States. And so some of the key areas there include uh, patent policy and intellectual property protection, uh, the importance of communications policy uh, is just going to impact every career. I often say that every member's career is going to be impacted by public policy in some way, uh, and it's valuable to know what's happening in those areas. We're also focused on immigration policy to make sure that we have solid high-tech immigration, uh, you know, permanent high-tech immigration coming into the country, that we have uh, patent reform, 
that we have medical technology policy that makes sense, and there are many other areas. All this work is done by volunteers. So you say, what is the nature of IEEE USA? It's a volunteer-led organization. Volunteers do the policies, volunteers do the grassroots lobbying, uh, volunteers create and deliver the programs through the section structure that you described earlier. Uh, that's what IEEE USA is all about. I think that was just a 